Welcome, thank you for joining us. I am Dean Amber Miller, and I'm here to welcome you to this week's installment of the Dornsife Dialogues. I'd like to start by thanking the USC Gould School of Law for joining us in co-sponsoring this very important and timely conversation that we will be having this week. The recent tragedies involving the killing of black people by police is driving a movement, one that shines a light not only on our nation's history of racism, but on a history of apathy. It's frustrating to think that we need bloodshed, funerals, and protests to wake up. It's infuriating that anyone still needs to be convinced that Black Lives Matter. But I believe there are ways forward, particularly if we focus on addressing the policy that undergirds a broken system. I'm looking forward to hearing from today's panel, featuring scholars from Dornsife Department of Psychology, the Gould School of Law, and a prominent advocate from the Los Angeles LGBT Center. It's a great opportunity to talk across disciplines and think about integrated solutions. Our moderator is Reverend Najuma Smith Pollard, who serves as a program manager for the USC Cecil Murray Center for Community Engagement. She's also the executive director for the Southern California School of Ministry. Under the tutelage of civil rights icon, Reverend Chip Murray, she was ordained in 1996, and she has spent her career pursuing her passion to serve others. Her work has included building training programs and entrepreneurial endeavors, many of which focus on supporting women and raising awareness of sexual violence. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to the Reverend to introduce our guests. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Dean Miller, and thank you, Jim, for this uh, wonderful opportunity. Um, I'm really excited about today's uh, conversation, discussion. Uh, we're in a very interesting time, some would say even difficult time, but I believe as we continue to have these dialogues across sectors, um, we, can, we can come to some solutions um, and certainly be, a, be at a place where we can begin to reimagine America, a country that really does overcome this issue of racism. And so I want to uh, go ahead and introduce our panelists for today. Um, first up, I want to introduce um, Professor, he's the Associate Professor I'm so sorry, she's an associate professor of School of Psychology and Psychiatry, April Thames, Thames, I'm sorry, I'm messing that up, April Thames, who also leads the Social Neuroscience and Health Psychology Lab at USC Dornside College of Letter, Arts, and Science. Um, April, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank Hi, you so April. Thank you for having me here. It's good to have you with us. Um, so um, it's no surprise that uh, to anyone that racism can impact the mental health of people who are uh, targets. Um, but you've published research that shows racism actually has toxic effect on the psychological health of people. Uh, share with us a little bit about that, please. Sure, I have a real interest in drivers of disease and chronic illness. And some of the work that I have done is focused on the way that genes express themselves, particularly those genes that are responsible for immunity. And my work is really focused on how racism and discrimination actually changes the way that these genes express themselves that in such a manner that makes people susceptible to chronic illness and disease. Um, also, as a, as a neuropsychologist, I'm interested in the brain and how the stress of racism also impacts um, brain function and can make people very susceptible for downstream neurological conditions as well. I know uh, Rand several years ago did a study um, on the impact of trauma on young youth, children that are in schools and, and how the trauma of what they were experiencing was impacting their ability to learn in schools. And so when we talk about racism and the impact, it's not just the, you know, the things that we experience, but it's even how we process information that's shared with us going forward. So thank you for that, April. Let's bring in our other guests because we're gonna continue this conversation dialogue and go a little deeper. Um, next, I'd like to bring in to further our discussion um, USC gals Roy P. Crocker, professor of law. He's an expert um, on racial justice, criminal justice, and the rule of law, Mr. Jody R. Moore. Jody, are you with us? Yes, I am. Hi, good Jody. It's good to be with you. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, so let me hit you with this question. Um, what would it take to make Black lives matter in America from your thoughts? Oh yeah, well, one of the things it would take is, uh, I'll go with the psychological uh, data that 
you know, I've looked at in my research and there was some discussion about psychology just before me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think that it's very revealing to look at now some of these recent studies. When I started writing about unconscious bias, we didn't have a lot of brain imaging studies. We didn't have the possibility to say, here's your brain, here's your brain on race, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I talked a lot about the cognitive unconscious back in those days, but now with these more recent studies, we're able to explain why it is that we could have all of those black bodies standing on those rooftops in the, uh, in the, um, in Louisiana, in the, um, you know, wards with water coming up to their neck, literally, and FEMA unable to get in there one, after one day had gone by, two days had gone by, three days had gone by, four days go by and water is still up to their neck in the ninth ward of those black folks in Louisiana after Hurricane Katrina because there wasn't a panic of empathy for their well-being. Sean Finn was rowing up there handing out fresh water Four days in, FEMA still couldn't get its act together. Compare that response to the response after 9-11 when those planes ran into those buildings and there was a panic of empathy for those people. We didn't let any bureaucratic impediments get in the way. We just got them help because those lives matter. They mattered in a different way than the black lives that did not matter in the Ninth Ward. And what we're seeing in America now, when you go through Skid Row, for example, in downtown LA, the fiercest expression of structural violence in America, the highest concentration of homeless folk in America. You see, again, 75% of the butt faces are black and water's coming up to their neck and we, there's no panic of empathy for them. Those black lives don't matter. They don't matter when they're, we see the same demographics in jails and prison cells and they don't matter when we see the disproportionate impact that COVID-19 is having on the black community because of all kinds of environmental racism and other factors. So that's what we're talking about when we're saying black lives matter. They should matter too. Not only black, it's not saying only black lives matter. It's not saying white lives don't matter, Latino lives don't matter, Asian lives don't matter. What, what we're saying is black lives matter also. Black lives matter too, but we don't treat them as they do as a collective uh, group. Right, and, and thank you for that, Jody. And thinking as, as you were talking about the neck, um, it draw my attention to the rise in uh, hangings of black black bodies here in California. I think there have been up to six uh, black bodies found hanging from trees. And then the noose, um, one of the race car drivers, NASCAR. And so this, the that the the, um, the imagery and the the images of those bodies hanging from trees, the neck, um, and the impact that that does on pe on a people um, psychologically. Is, um, is very intense, so thank you for that. Um, and then finally, we wanna add to our discussion, uh, a prominent activist for transgender equality with Los Angeles LGBTQ Center and Board of the Black LGBTQ um, Activists for Change, and who also organized the All Black Lives Matter March in Hollywood just two weeks ago, uh, Blossom Blown. Blossom, are you with us? I sure am. How are hey. you this lovely afternoon? <laughs> great. We are great. It's good to have you on with us, Blossom. We're going to just start you off with this question around um, the impact of racism on black, li black lives beyond the stress and the anxiety and psychology that's been mentioned. What were some thoughts that you had? I'll be quite. I'll be quite honest with you. I think that Black trans people, because I can only speak as a Black trans woman, have a different experience within the Black community. Because I'm ready to talk about it. You know, Black trans people are still having rights taken away from them. Um, black trans people are having a hard time finding a place in the Black movement because, on one hand, we're trying to defend our Blackness and having to remind everyone that we are Black too. And then with our transness it is often not acknowledged. And for me, honestly, how can we be empowered to dismantle white supremacy, but be disempowered to acknowledge the existence of black trans people in the movement? We have a lot of work to do when it comes to black solidarity versus yeah. black unity, for right. the most part. Um, one thing that I will say, black trans people are being killed at such an alarming rate. We are still being killed by police. Black trans women are experiencing um, violence at such higher rates. And the gag, and, and I want to say the gag is Black trans women are experiencing violence from Black men, which we're not ready to talk about. These same Black men that we're going out and protesting for. Mm -hmm. Now, we must not cherry pick which Black lives matter. We must not be reactive 
Right. We must learn to be proactive when we say the names of Black trans people also within the Black movement. If we're going to say George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, we also need to talk about Tony McDay, Dominique Fells, Raya Milton, and all of the Black trans people that um, have died. In my humble personal opinion, when we do not do that within the Black community, we have become the oppressor in our own community. We have let white supremacy come in like a chameleon, gotten under our skin, and we have become the oppressor to our own people. Um, and, and, and you said something about lynching. I like that you said that. You know, I'm going to go into astrology right quick. Pluto is in retrograde right now until October. Pluto talks about regeneration, transformation, death and rebirth. Mm -hmm. um, Jim Crow has regenerated itself. Lynching has regenerated itself. Now it's your knee on my neck and I can't breathe. Mm -hmm. um, and ironically, the nooses are back. We are starting to see the nooses come back. Mm -hmm. And then the reality of it is everybody's trying to find their place in this movement. And those that don't, that feel left out are having to create their own movement, which means we're having separate but equal movement. Yeah. This is no different than whites having their restroom right here and colored people having their restroom right here. I was born and raised in Mississippi. Yeah. Sorry about that. Sorry. I was born and raised in Mississippi. And so I'm only one generation removed from Jim Crow. My parents were born at the end of it. My grandparents and great grandparents experienced the sit-ins, the fire hoses. They saw everything. They saw it all. And so the reality of it is, when I really sit here and I think about it, we've really never left Jim Crow. It mm -hmm. just learned to flourish right now in 2020. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, anxiety is definitely at an all time high, but you know, I think that's where the conversation of mental health and everything else comes, to play, and comes into play. And I can't wait to hear about that. Absolutely, thank you for that, Blossom. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna just circle back to you real quick and then I'm gonna come back to April and Jody, um, because recently there was a decision with the Supreme Court and um, that protect LGBTQ workers. Um, but I think people saw that and, and, and had an expectation that that protected all across the board. So speak to that a little bit, that truth that that that, that protection didn't include everybody. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, so, and we, for LG, yeah, so for LGBTQ people, it did kind of masquerade as everybody was protected. At the same time, at the same time as LGBTQ um, protections um, being protected, our dreamers were protected. Mm -hmm. But the healthcare system in the trans community was not protected. Mm -hmm. Trans people can be discriminated against in the healthcare system right now because the Trump administration took it all away from us. Mm -hmm. At the same time, that good news was coming through. I want to remind people that until all LGBTQ dot dot people are free, none of us are free. Until all black people are free, none of us are free. So I, I think we need not to get too comfortable because we have a trans community, which I am definitely a part of, where a lot of my trans siblings intersect as dreamers, intersect um, identifying within the LGBTQ spectrum. Intersectionality is definitely an important conversation, but we have to move along, just, move above just intersectionality. The reality of it is, Trans rights are still being taken away from us right now. Mm -hmm. Trans youth are still not able to use the restroom that they feel most comfortable with without mm -hmm. being policed by adults who are mm -hmm. acting like bullies. Trans people are still having a hard time serving in the military. Mm -hmm. We have become the pawn of the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. so easy mm -hmm. for us all to forget that when gay marriage was, a th was um, when we were fighting for gay marriage, trans people were right there on the sidelines watching in solidarity with our siblings and now that trans rights are being taken away from us i'm hearing a lot of crickets right. we got to do better absolutely thank you for that blossom and i definitely agree with you that we got to do better across the board april let me ask this question of you as um and blossom brought the issue of health and health care um and one of the things that COVID 19 did of course was just really peel the onion and the banana peel all the peelings came off um, about the disparity in health equity. Um, can speak to that a little bit to us and how do we, how do we begin to rectify that, that black lives begin to matter within the healthcare system? Well, I, I mean, it's a great question. I think that when it came out with COVID and the disparities, people were really shocked. And I didn't really know why, because we've known this for years mm -hmm. that, you know, there are disproportionate rates of certain chronic illnesses in the black community. We know that uh, 
black patients are treated much differently within the healthcare system. So, so the COVID, yes, it, it shined a real light on it that I think everybody, you know, who wasn't aware said, oh, aha, wow, this is disproportionately happening in the black community and why? And what was frustrating for me, I will say, is re reading, you know, not saying that this, that the underlying health conditions are not part of it, but as someone who studies immunity and looks at health outcomes, it's more than just, oh, well, the black people are getting it because they have the underlying health conditions. Right. It was almost like, let's just put it on that. And let's let's just explain it in that domain. So I've tried to talk about, you know, how stress interacts with the way that our bodies actually respond to when you come into contact with a pathogen. And and so when you look at all the the black uh, when you look at the black cases of or the disproportionate rates, but not just disproportionate rates of COVID, it's more about the severity. We're seeing more of the cytokine storm, if you will. This is when they talk about the emerging of this inflammation. That's where the severe COVID cases are happening. Mm -hmm. And it's disproportionately happening among Blacks. Mm -hmm. And it's not just because they, they have the underlying health conditions. Right, right. And I think that's the struggle for people to understand. Um, well, it's a struggle, but I think what COVID did in as we also moved into this um, racial injustice uh, uh, with the marching and the protests and and the discussions that have just kind of uh, that have rose to the top, um, people didn't people I think there was to a degree people did not realize the racial injustice within the healthcare system. So when we talk about the truth about being black in America, it's the mother who goes in to have a baby and who's not given the same care and the same urgency as another mother uh, who's non-black and that and the black mother dies during childbirth but that's a result not just because she wasn't at her best health or somebody else was healthier there's some real issues happening where her care is not seen as a priority because she's a black woman and god forbid she's a black woman in poverty or a black woman who you know comes in with whatever her stuff might be um and so so thank you for that jody let me ask this question of you as one who studies policy so what are some of the policy changes that we need to begin to see um to to kind of just change the tide on what's happening to us psychologically how do we where do, what's some of the policies I can't hear you now. um i couldn't quite hear your question at the very oh, end I'm i heard sorry. about policy changes yeah. oh, you're, oh you're, yes you're i was at, I'm sorry i'm sorry I didn't broken, hear me. I was but, asking what policies then, one who studies law, what policies come up for you that need to really be looked at um, so we can begin to see some, you know, as it relates to the truth about being black, what are some real policy changes we need to begin to see? Um, all right, I'm gonna go with what policy changes do I, would I advocate at this time since I couldn't hear much of the connection. And for I'm me, I, I'll just start, it's real simple for, for, for starters uh, to, tie my remarks to this moment we find ourselves in mm -hmm. when we're talking about police brutality and what are the possible responses to and remedies for police brutality. Quite simply, defund the police, mm -hmm. right? That is a battle cry, a mantra, a slogan that you've heard. There's been a lot of tone policing by certain people um, telling protesters you shouldn't use that language because it's too radical somehow, and it will turn people off, as though Black Lives Matter as a catchphrase and as a mantra didn't turn people off. But I remember when we were first using that back in 2013, 14, 15, people were saying, oh, that's an alienating phrase. All lives matter, blue lives matter, you know? Um, so there is no slogan that people are going to not criticize who don't want to really acknowledge what it is that we're grappling with. What, what we mean by defund the police is simply this. When you go through Skid Row and look at that, like I said, fiercest, expre fiercest expression of structural violence in America, Mm -hmm. um, those families out there on sidewalks with tents over their heads uh, trying to scratch out a, a, an existence. Um, and you notice that 75% again of those faces are black. 
the reason go skid row exists is because yeah when you look at our budget for los angeles mayor garcetti for 2020 2021 had proposed for the 5.5 billion dollars unrestricted funds that's basically our slush fund that 53.7 percent of that go toward the lapd 53.7 percent right now of that 5.5 billion so that's money a good chunk of that money should be going not towards more policing but rather towards social services social um, social workers um housing for the houseless right. uh jobs for the jobless food for the hungry that, that we could make a big dent in what the problems we're seeing in skid row by mm -hmm. diverting some of those funds what we do instead is for example in 2006 we have the Safer Cities Initiative in which we put 80 additional officers in Skid Row to crack down on the down and out in the name of so-called therapeutic policing. You know, we, you know, our conclusion was that homelessness is not the result of a lack of affordable housing, health care, both mental and physical, that's affordable and, and readily accessible, and food shortages and the like, but rather internal deficiencies and, and shortcomings and lack of personal responsibility by those people in Skid Row. And so what we needed to do was put them in handcuffs, get sight them, throw them in jail cells, and then send them to mega shelters where they go through 12 step programs to repair their inner brokenness. And that would be the solution to homelessness, right? We put all of that money in 20, 2006, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, squandered all those resources on all of those police officers, turning them into street level social workers for what? The, the homelessness problem has just gotten worse since. So that's what I mean when I'm talking about defund the police. We need to have police do what police do best. And that is go after violent crimes, rapes. Those crimes are not being solved in black communities and many other communities. Rapes are only being solved about a 20% rate. Rape kit backlogs are, are building up and we're being warehoused in police departments because they're chasing turnstile jumpers and doing broken windows policing and not doing the kind of thing they should be doing. So that's brief defund the police would be um, number one um, policy intervention I think we can make that would address the concerns that are, have people in the street right now. Right, thank you for that, Jody. And recently, um, unfortunately, things didn't get passed the way we had hoped, but there was a recent uh, vote um, with the uh, Los Angeles Unified School District um, in hopes of getting the police, I the school police, the school, you can't hear me? To get the school, can you hear me now? Is that better? Recently, uh, recently there was um, some converse, not, not conversation, there was a vote um, with the LAUSD, Los Angeles by School District, around the Los Angeles school police um, to get some of, to hopefully get the school board members to pass a budget or to pass um, on some bills that were presented that would phase out the budget for the Los Angeles school district police because what, what we've tried to do even with our schools, and this is important for people to know, we've tried to police away our challenges within our school district. And one of the things that I think is important, thank you, Jody, and I wanna tie this back to something that April's been talking about um, around health is uh, safety, public safety doesn't begin with police. Public safety begins with um, the public and, and the care of people. It does not begin with police. And so thank you, Jody, for bringing that up because when we talk about divesting the budget, we're talking about divesting the budget into areas that would then deal with the trauma that you spoke to April and the psychological issues that would then make for a better community, a better society because people are now getting treatment for their, for their issues as well as Blossom and the areas in which you're fighting for, when we divest these funds, now we can see money going to places where people, where, where public safety is being addressed from a place of dealing with the individual, dealing with communities and families, because public safety does not begin with police. And I think that's where, to, what you're, to your point, Jody, 53% of our budget, that's more than half of the budget for the city is going to policing. But none of us feel safe because we have additional officers because we have additional police officers in our communities safe because of the community which they're in and the care that they're receiving and the way in which their needs are being met. So thank you both. We're going to take a couple of questions. Thank you all. We're going to take a couple of questions um, from 
Okay, wonderful. We got music in the background. <laughs> uh, so we're going to take a couple of questions. Uh, no problem. We got a little DJ in the background. Um, so somebody asked a question. This is from Angelina. She says, while out protesting, I encountered an officer arguing with protesters. The officer mentioned the, the black on black crime factor, um, suggesting that more black people kill black people than cops do. Um, and, and so the question was, um, how do we begin to change the, the, the narrative around that? Um, and one of the things that we know is that cops are trained to protect and to serve, but what is your redress to that argument? We know that there are black on black crime. I don't think that anyone's not saying that that doesn't exist. Right. I think what the, the issues are is what you were actually were talking to about public safety. There's a lot of trauma among these communities and the trauma is very, very deep that people often don't understand. And it's about, even when you start thinking about schools and kids really young and, and it's like, oh, how come they're not, you know, finishing, oh, they're not finishing school. Well, you know, for that child, if they're coming from um, a, an environment where it's not even safe to walk to school, it's mm -hmm. not safe to be a black kid in a school, because of you know whatever potential you know that can happen mm -hmm. these are this manifests in the form of self protection joining gangs we see this all the time these are not things that communities of color are doing because they want to they are joining gangs or you know engaging in in trying to you know if it's you know uh, stealing or whatever to get resources that of communities of privilege don't need to worry about. So I, in a way, it's like I, when people say, well, there's black on black crime too, that doesn't give the right for, the, for, the, for these other actions. That doesn't excuse it. So that's, that's my personal opinion about the issue. Yeah, thank you for the April Blossom. What, what is your, as it relates to our, the, our LGBTQ um, community, um, somebody asked a question, how, what, what are some things that they can do to get involved in the movement? Um, and what, what are some things that you would offer for those that want to be in the fight with our LGBTQ brothers and sisters? Um, unmute yourself, Blossom, please. You're muted. Yeah, Blossom needs to be unmuted. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> um, I think first of all, it starts with donating to some of these LGBTQ-led organizations. Um, if you want to get more specifically involved with helping the trans community, we have several great trans-led organizations, grassroots organizations that you can put your uh, kind of put your money where your mouth is right. and be able to help to learn to understand the movement. Um, I think it's also about taking the time to really educate yourself and get to a place where you want to become an accomplice. Notice I say accomplice and not an ally. Anybody can be an ally and say that they are an ally and their actions don't justify what their um, words are. But right. when you're an accomplice, you never have to worry about it because loyalty is there. You're always on the front lines with us. And mm -hmm. it's just really, really important to understand. And um, you know, just going back to what Jody was saying, like I really love the way that he described defunding the police and what that looks like. That's probably one of the best ways I've heard describe it. You know, because for me, just being, I now know that the police are betrayal, are betrayal to my black body. Okay. I understand that because at the end of the day, as a black trans woman, you're not going to care about my life. I'm sorry. And I'm just keeping it 100. And this is just my honest opinion. And um, a lot of it is trauma. It's generational trauma mm -hmm. that has been passed on to us that we are inheriting. And sometimes we inflict it on each other, um, you know, and within the LGBTQ community, we come from a lot of trauma because a lot of our access um, is hard for us to grab and reach. Right. And so people have to really understand. And I think honestly, when because I'm a person that likes to peel back the layers, Absolutely. you know, I think we're only scratching the surface with LGBTQ community all together, because let me be very clear, every subgroup within the LGBTQ spectrum mm -hmm. is treated differently. They have different needs. And I just want to speak more back to like the T and the Q because mm -hmm. I feel like we are at the bottom of the totem pole. Mm -hmm. You know, we're having to fight within the spectrum just you. to have us 
heard okay. and have a scene. And, you know, my, I have trans siblings that are in Hollywood. I have trans siblings that are in the nonprofit organizations um, that are in, like on the, on the front lines, just fighting, fighting, fighting. You know, I have my trans siblings that are undocumented. Yeah. Um, you know, we're all here. And I just think, and honestly, it's all about putting your money where your mouth is. Um, understanding, and I love that we're really talking about mental health. And I'm so appreciative of, of us having that conversation because that looks completely different in the LGBTQ spectrum, especially with trans people. You know, give us access to services. Right. We right. need more access to services. I think those are some of the things that we could do. Yeah, April, go ahead. She, I just want to, uh, yeah, I just want to point out what Blossom saying about the mental health and about funding because this is mental health is so underfunded, yes. and when you start even trying to get into Black communities and Black mental health, it's even less. Right, and I can tell you as someone who has studied racism, health, mental health, it is so hard to get funded. Mm -hmm for this kind of work. It is so hard to get funded for community work. And, and often people say, oh, well, you know, go out to the community and do this and this and that, you know, and, it, and it's like, there, there's no money behind it. Right. There needs to right. be funding efforts behind the, the, act, the activism and the community, mm -hmm. you know, being someone who's in, in academia, you know, I know that in terms of doing the research and trying to figure out what the right in interventions really are, because mm -hmm. I'm not convinced that half the interventions out there work, you right. know, in these, I, I think they were done at the ivory tower mm -hmm. and that's who it works for, you know? And so I, but there's not enough money to really, and that, and that I hope changes at some right. point. And as we're talking about the truth about being black in America, that's, for those that are watching, and we have now a little over, uh, almost 330 of you watching um, in the Zoom room, but also those of you that are watching live on Facebook on the different Facebook channels, um, this issue, you know, it really does require the funding um, to really make some some of these things happen. Um, and so it's not just it's not just the protest, though the protest must happen, um, it, and it's policy change, but it's also the funding. And so this conversation around defund the police to, to what Jody brought up um, and what you're saying, April and Blossom, it allows those fund those dollars to go to places so we can really see the health of our communities um, change and be transformed. Um, so that way we can begin to see the, the numbers. I mean, I, to your point, Jody, about um, Skid Row, I mean, the 35% of the Skid Row um, uh, residents are African-American men, and that's not because more African-American men choose to be homeless on Skid Row. That's a real systematic issue and a failed system around mental health. Um, and so thank you all for where we're going. So we have a little more than 330, almost 330 people on here. Um, and we have a couple of questions that I want to uh, come out some of our listeners. Jody, I'm going to push this one towards you because this is a PhD candidate, um, and they asked the question, as a PhD candidate and TA at Dornsife, I'm, I'm wondering what I can do as a future scholar and instructor to create a diverse and inclusive environment in my field and of activity and work. And do you have any suggestions? Oh yeah, well, you know, it's, it's difficult a lot of times out here because uh, folks have ghettoized a lot mm -hmm. of academia that's focused on racial and social justice issues. You, it doesn't penetrate the everyday curriculum as it should. You know, we have special seminars over here that are gonna deal with racial and social justice or a okay. special class over here when it should be incorporated into the everyday curriculum. I should not be able to teach accident law in my, my own torts course without bringing race and gender and class into the classroom in order to keep the classroom relevant to the real world. If you want the classroom to be relevant to the real world, you have to bring the real world into the classroom. I shouldn't be able to teach criminal law without bringing racial, gender, class, justice issues into the classroom. And so, you know, part of it is challenging the paradigms out there that say, as, an, as a scholar, that say these issues are peripheral or, or secondary, they are central. You cannot understand the criminal justice system without understanding racial justice. Look, like I said, uh, it's 75%, by the way, of the, of the places in Skid Row are black. Um, 
you go into the prisons, again, you see a demography that looks not unlike Skid Row. And if you're talking about criminal justice, how can you begin to talk about all of those disproportionately black faces in the jails and prisons um, without addressing racial justice, right? Without addressing the fact that, as I do in my forthcoming book on, on August 18th, I have a book dropping called, uh, and this is a trigger warning for those who have trouble with edgy language, nigger theory, race, uh, language, unequal justice in the law. And the reason I use that blood, blood soaked epithet to talk about this particular population of people that we've locked up and warehoused in prisons is because one of the reasons we're able to treat them as just so much toxic human waste and disregard their well being and give them sentences like 25 to life for low level nonviolent offenses is because we've otherized them. We've demonized them, we've monsterized them. In other words, we've niggerized them and we've found that easier to do when they have black skin. And so, yes, how do you, we have to make sure that the, these issues are at the core of the, of the everyday curriculum and not ghettoized and marginalized and shunted to the side. And I think you bring up something that is uh, another truth that we have to deal with is that people don't wanna be made to feel uncomfortable with language, but we, we are beyond being uncomfortable. As, as, as black people, we're beyond being uncomfortable, but at, at this tick of the watch, everybody needs to be uncomfortable with racial injustice because it doesn't just affect me as a black woman or you, Jody, as a black man, or you, Blossom, as a trans, or you, April. It, doesn't, it, it affects all of us. And I think that's where people have to understand is that, is that this, this, this need to not be uncomfortable um, and, it, and I think what 2020 is doing with all that's happening and, and all the way things are evolving um, is that people are starting to feel uncomfortable across the board and, 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 that, and that is a good thing because uncomfortable um, hopefully allows us to make some changes or at least be open to make some changes um, in the way in which this, you know, way in which we go forward um, in, in our nation. April, I had a question for you. Um, someone asked, can you explain more about the factors aside from underlying chronic conditions that affect severe COVID cases being disproportionately high among Blacks? And I know we kind of talked about that a little bit, uh, but they said, are there other factors and how do, we, how do they lead to more severe cases? Are there, are there any other factors? I think there are several other factors mm -hmm. that we need to think about. For one, if we just look at the uh, representation of blacks in essential jobs, you know, and how in terms of just, you know, the social distancing is a privilege to say, oh, work from home, you know, and don't go around people that that's carries a certain weight of privilege mm -hmm. that not everybody has. So, so on one hand, there's exposure, you know, mm -hmm. peer exposure, um, but, but on a biological level, if we think about sort of what stress does, you know, to the immune system. We know there's been several scholars before me that have already linked racism and discrimination to poor health outcomes. Mm -hmm. We know that chronic stress results in changes in the body, which we call inflammation. We know that blacks have higher inflammation across the, when you look at across several studies, and they look between blacks and whites, there's higher levels of inflammation. So when we think about COVID specifically and the mechanisms that COVID affects, it is um, going, it, it has the potential to dis be disproportionately more severe among blacks if there's already existing higher levels of inflammation already existing changes in receptors that are involved in blood pressure. We know that discrimination, it's clear, it affects nighttime blood pressure, which is the blood pressure when there's, um, when elevations are at night, we know that it damages organ tissue. So I would say that there are structural reasons for why there may be these disproportionate rates, but there's also, if we think about biological and stress and how stress results in inflammation and changes in immune system compromise, it, it to me, it, it makes a lot of sense why we're seeing these more severe cases. And, uh, and I have a question for you, Blossom, but April, some would say, oh, that's, 
you know, that, that, you know, these things are not tied to race, that you, the people are just making these up. So what, what would you say to those criticisms that this is? Oh, you know, I, I, I've had a lot of those criticisms when I've written these articles that, you know, I mean, so what's funny is everybody wants to blame it on, you know, well, not funny, but what's ironic is, you know, everyone wants to say, well, no, it's probably other things. You know, mm -hmm. it's not really racism or discrimination, it's other stress. Right. And so we've looked at other stress and actually we've accounted for socioeconomic status. So right. yes, poverty's, and one thing I want to get across is that when we talk about chronic stress, yes, poverty is a stressor. Yes, um, losing your job is a stressor, but race-related stress is so much different because right. it is something that you cannot problem solve to, right. cause you don't, and you don't know when it's gonna happen next. You don't know when someone's going to discriminate against you right. next. Right. So, right. That, so what I've been trying to get my point across with, this, with, with the idea here is that when we're talking about racism and discrimination as a stressor, Right. It's a whole different level of a type of stressor that people are live like living. people are literally living with it every single day. Right. It's it's the father that is uh, is very weary of how he goes to work every day. It's the black father who's trying to just take care of his family, but he has to be concerned about you know how he drives to work. Um, it's the son who has to be concerned about um, you know if he gets put up by police while walking to school. It's the black mother who goes into the hospital to have a baby and she has to deal with the stress of a doctor who doesn't see her needs as a priority. And so when we talk about these stressors, they show up in the day-to-day -day life, but unless you're experiencing them, they don't, you don't, you don't, of course you don't feel it because it's not you. It's not happening to you. Yeah, yeah. don't even get me started about the face mask, you mm -hmm. know, and it's- Oh, I, yeah, I've seen so many <laughs> posts about, they, I've, I've actually heard men, and, and Jody, a blossom of the company, I've actually had, heard, heard men share with me that they're intentionally wearing flower print face masks so that they don't look intimidating with the black face masks and how how uncomfortable it was for a lot of black men to put those face masks on and go into banks go into stores because there's already this preconceived notion that you're a criminal anyway and then now to add this face mask on and gloves it just it just it, it, it heightened their own concern about how they were perceived which is a whole nother level of stress. So thank you for that, April. Blossom, I wanna to come to you. You wanted to say something okay. to that? Wow, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, I heard stories a lot from like my black brothers about that, like the concern of, yes. you know, uh, of that. Like, you know, as we can see with these black deaths um, that continuously keep piling up, mm -hmm. um, that people think that our black bodies are so disposable, you know, that's what happened to our Mar Aubrey. Like that's, you know, like it's just the stigma within our community is very, very real. It's very, very real. And, you know, I, as time is going on, mm -hmm. the reality of it is, and I'm, I'm gonna throw a little numerology at you because I love astrology and numerology. We're in the year 2020. 2020 reduces to the number four. Four, the number four talks about foundations, hard work, and pragmatism. Ironically, 2021 is the year of the five, which talks about challenge, change, and freedom. We are literally laying down the foundation for change, and we're literally laying down the foundation for freedom. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's really important to keep these conversations, like, really, really going. I really like what Jody was saying earlier about um, having to implement a lot of this stuff into, um, like, okay. everyday studies and stuff like that, you know. Um, I totally 100% agree with that because I feel like everywhere I go, because I'm a person that's in many different genres. Um, I'm in public health. I'm in entertainment. Um, I'm in the spiritual world. Like I'm in so many different places. And my activism, I'm very intentional about putting that into every single space that I walk into because I need people within uh, this genre and people over here in this genre to understand what is really going on in the world. What yeah. is going on with Black people? What is going on with black people like me? You know, how can we be better? And mm -hmm. I'm already starting to see the change now just in my own neighborhood. Like, you know, white people and, 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 and black people are having these open conversations. Um, Anti-blackness, which is a very prominent thing among other people of color, which we really don't address a lot of because me coming from Mississippi where I had to deal with racist white people and moving here to California and having to deal with uh, anti-black people of color, other people of color who are anti-black. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's been a very interesting um, thing for me. 
but you know, I just, the system has never really protected black people, period. Mm -hmm. We have never been protected. And again, going back to that generational trauma, which will, has been passed on to us from right. our ancestors and we will, we will pass it on, you know, in a little while. And so it's just, it's really, really interesting. I'm a big believer that, you know, we can water a seed all day long, right. but if there's no light, no sunlight to come in and shine a light on that seed, how can we grow? How right. can we have bigger conversations about that if we are not willing to shine a light on these issues right here? And so I appreciate that we're having this conversation. And, and talking about shining a light on issue, there was a question. I'm going to direct this to you, Blossom, and you can answer okay. with, Then I'm going to go to Jody. Jody, with some questions for you. Um, okay. you, are, you were the organizer for the big uh, march in Hollywood recently. Yeah. And so someone's question was around signing petitions, sending emails, making phone calls, all this kind of protest work all these actions um and the the question was do are these things really helpful for the cause so are the are the is the protest the petitions the emails the phone calls are they significant to the cause and to what degree are they significant if you can absolutely ask. absolutely absolutely and you know people think that this doesn't do anything it, it, it lets everybody know that we are ready to show up. It shows everybody that we are ready to put out a call to action. Absolutely. Getting out in those streets, protesting, making your voices heard. You know, it doesn't matter what little thing you do, you know, because we're so, we always want to judge the platform that everybody sits on. You know, all of these things make a big difference. I was, yes, I was one of the organizers um, from a great team, which was actually spearheaded by Brandon Anthony and Gerald Clark, who actually were the creators of um, the board and the creators of this march. And, you know, I'm so grateful they were able to bring me on. And the reason why we really did that march is because we want to remind everybody that we cannot leave a subsect, we cannot leave a group of people out of a powerful movement. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, even though that may not be the intention, we can't help how people feel. You can't police other people's feelings. And so, we got to get to this place where I got to come to you and figure out ways of making you feel included instead of just defending the whole thing. And so, you know, it's all about having those powerful um, conversations, um, right. basically. Um, but yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that, Blossom. Jody. I, there was a question for you um, around dismantling um, the mass, mass and the prison industrial system complex. Uh, where there, somebody was asked a question as it relates to mass incarceration, where do we begin to dismantle that? And then I want to connect that with another question for you, which is uh, someone asked that they have a 10 year old daughter and the 10 year old daughter wanted to know if she has the right to ask an officer to, if she's approached by the police to make sure his camera is on, his body cam is on. So if you can answer those two. Yeah, well, sadly, a lot of times they don't turn on the body cameras. That's one of the reasons the body camera intervention hasn't proved very helpful, mm -hmm. successful. When they do turn it on, they still control what footage they're going to show after they've decided how they're going to edit it. Those are the kind of interventions that we're finding are just reformist, incrementalist interventions that haven't made the, the difference that we all hope they would. And that's why we have to have more fundamental changes. Mm -hmm. And those more fundamental changes are why I've written my latest book. You know, if we're going to think differently about mass incarceration, which was the first part of your question, mm -hmm. we're going to have to fundamentally think differently about wrongdoers. Right. You know, we're going to have to think in a profoundly different way about violent wrongdoers. Mm -hmm. You know, Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, was important to get people to start to think about mass incarceration as a civil rights issue that she published in 2010. But mm -hmm. it, was it was based on a factual error, mm -hmm. a fundamental factual mistake. She mm -hmm. said in the book and says repeatedly that we went from 300,000 people incarcerated in 1980 to two over 2.2 million by the time you get to the aughts by arresting and jailing a lot of low-level nonviolent drug offenders. Mm -hmm. Well, that, as a rhetorical strategy, that sounds pretty good because it's telling people, oh, people who are in prison are just guilty of minor infractions and they're just like the rest of us and we don't really have to change our moral framework very much to um, be a, attentive to their needs and concerns. The reality is, John Fab pointed this out in his book, uh, Locked In, a couple years ago, that if you take, look at the state system, which is where 87% of the prisoners are, right. only 5 to 6% of those prisoners are there for low-level nonviolent drug offenses. Right. 
Mm -hmm. When I take my students up to San Quentin, when we go down to Terminal Island, I don't see any, I'm not just saying hardly any, I don't see any low level nonviolent drug offenders when I go into San Quentin. I'm not saying there are none there, we don't see them, right? Most of the people in state prisons are there for violent offenses, they're there for serious offenses. So mm -hmm. if we're going to really make deep cuts in mass incarceration, we're gonna to have to overhaul our moral framework, our moral compass when it comes to criminal wrongdoing. That's a deeper challenge. You know, that's a much more profound challenge. That's why in my book, I go into more moral philosophy, um, the phenomenon called moral luck. I go into different theories of law. I have to come up with a new theory of mens rea and legal analyses. I have to think about language differently. Let me give you one quick example. Yes, please. Of how we otherize criminals. Right. And how pernicious it is. One of the reasons my work is called nigger theory is Chris Rock launched his comedic career in 1997 with a routine called Bring the Pain, in which he goes back and, front, back and forth in front of an all-black audience with basically the following routine. I'll paraphrase it, right? The, it starts off with, it's like a civil war going on in black America, and there's two sides. There's black people and there's niggas. And niggas have got to go, I love black people, but I hate niggas. Boy, I wish they'd let me join the Ku Klux Klan. Should I do a drive-by from here to Brooklyn? And he goes on like that for 40 minutes, okay, demonizing, denigrating what he calls so-called N-words, right? And what's his core definition of a so-called N-word? A black criminal, a black person who's done crime. So by that definition, the up to 90% of young black males are going to wind up in jail on probation, on parole at some point in their lives. And I put this in an article recently. They said, Professor, we need a pinpoint site because that sounds hyperbolic. And I gave them the pinpoint site. Up to 90% of the young black males in some of these inner city neighborhoods who are going to wind up in jail on probation, on parole at some point in their lives are in words. What kind of politics is that? What kind of morality is that? We need to fundamentally overhaul that. And notice, um, Hillary Clinton was getting a lot of flack when she was running in 2016 for referring to black youth primarily as super predators, right? And she was demonized. For that. She didn't get that out of the thin air. There were a lot of black people saying that. That wasn't just her. We had a different moral compass then. So we have to fundamentally challenge and change that if we're going to really do something about mass incarceration. And that's what, you know, I'm trying to do with my recent scholarship. Yeah, fundamental change. I really appreciate that. So let me ask this question um, as we kind of wrap things up here. Um, we have one more question and I'm gonna, this question is for all of you across the board. Uh, Susan, uh, Susie asked a question, I stand with BLM, Black Lives Matter, and due to the taking the time to attend these webinars to USC and conversations, my black and African-American friends, um, uh, I, she, so she's saying that she's gotten engaged. She says, I am an alum and my son is a junior and his, and he has helped uh, us while COVID uh, to give attention to the vast racial inequality with, uh, with, our, with the black community. How do I bridge, and I wanna hear from each of you, my white friends with BLM, as I think fear is the key component as well as white privilege. And I tell them that what I've been doing, uh, she says, I'm a 60 year old white woman uh, and a USC uh, alum, alum but she wants to know how to, I'm assuming it sounds like how to connect, bring her white friends into the discussion and even the movement with BLM. And so I'll April Blossom and then Jody, and then we'll have a final wrap up question. How do people bring in, how do our white allies or white friends bring in other white people into this movement? I think that they have to, you know, they have to let them know that the, that it's it's going to be uncomfortable conversations that have to happen. There's going to be feelings that emerge um, where white people feel guilty, and there's this you know. Then what happens naturally is there's a defense mechanism, and it's like well, you know. And so so first, I think the important thing is just to acknowledge. I want to I want to help. I want to be part of this. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I'm probably going to say something them wrong and that's okay and I think that's the message like that that we have to give and 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 I've I've led a lot of um ethnic racial minority committees you know in my career and I always have had like what whether it's white students white trainees they're like can I come I want to learn about it. of course you can come but there's this fear I'm probably going to say something offensive so we need to get that out of the way and and, and send that message that yes you will say something offensive and you're probably going to 
also have some weird feelings along the way, but that's okay. Right, right. Thank you for that, April Blossom. Yeah. Um, How do we it's get? About, yeah. Yeah. It's about accountability. Mm, good. Just keeping it very real. It's all about accountability. Holding other people accountable. When you see problematic isms mm -hmm. that are happening, such as racism, classism, sexism, colorism, holding other, they're holding their white counterparts accountable. Now, here's the test. And I believe this is a whole ideology of, of testing. Right. You know, those that want to get involved will truly want to get involved, okay? Those that really don't, really don't want to be a part of the cause. The cause, plain and simple. Mm -hmm. Number one, if they truly don't want to get involved in the, in the cause, and they truly think that black, they have a whole different perception of Black Lives Matter. Number one, they're not your friends to begin with. Mm -hmm. And you know, the fact that you're hanging around that low vibrational energy is not gonna cut it. Mm -hmm. And so this is a perfect opportunity for you to move to higher elevation. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, I, I totally agree with what um, she was saying. Um, you know, it is very uncomfortable, but we gotta learn to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. It's called the uncomfortable truth. And, mm -hmm. for, and the reality of it is, you know, again, this is so ancestral, this is so like generational that I just really think 2020 is just the year, is the clear year of vision and it's also the year of awakening that now, it's, now all of a sudden we're finding white people who all of a sudden have been under the rock and been asleep for so long, wake up. Welcome mm -hmm. to the movement. Great, you're here. Mm -hmm. Now it's time to really learn, it's time to really educate yourself and understand because again, we want to look at the Black Lives Movement um, as just a whole, and that's great. But when you start, because again, I'm a, I'm a girl that likes to peel back the layers. When you start peeling back the layers, you yeah. will understand that there is a different need for Black women as it is for Black men. And I think a lot of these needs have been talked about on here today. There is a different need for Black trans men. There is a different need for Black trans women like myself and all of us that are in between. And so, you know, it's all about learning and educate, education for sure. Um, you could, and, and, and to her question, you can only do so much yeah. by yourself. You okay. can talk, you can convince, and that's great. But the reality of it is if they don't want to come, they truly don't want to come. And mm -hmm. you have to kind of reevaluate who you hang around. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Blossom. Jody? Yeah, right up here in this room, um, if you have a chance to check out ne a Netflix show from last uh, year, um, Chelsea Handler had a show called Hello Privilege, It's Me, Chelsea. And mm. she got some of that uh, documentary up here in the space that I'm in today with USC students, with my students from the law school. And mm. it was about white allyship or non-black allyship because it's not just white folks out right, in the absolutely. street. It's Latinos, it's Asian. Latinos right. know there's a lot of anti-blackness in Latino culture. You talk to some of my Afro-Latino friends, right? Black lives are a lot of times, again, discriminated again within the Latinx community, just like they are in a lot of, within a lot of other communities. And so, the, the, but she was specifically focusing on white allies and what white allyship looks like in these spaces. And um, there's a great group here in LA called White People for Black Lives, right? Who does a lot of good organizing um, around LA and, and activism. Uh, so you, you do have, that, you know, that impetus out there with a lot of non-black people to try to promote equality because they recognize that the most maligned and marginalized people in American society are indigenous people mm -hmm. who have been sadly almost completely wiped out of our country's, yeah. you know, spaces and discourse and African-American, black folk, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, kind of, Yes, we're going to have some uncomfortable conversations. The two hallmarks of Black Lives Matter, two hallmarks. One, shut it down, disruption. We need to cut through our collective complacency by shutting it down. Two, once it's shut down, let's have some uncomfortable conversations. By uncomfortable conversations, we mean conversations in which people are going to stick their feet in their mouths. They're going to, I'm, I stick my foot in my mouth a lot as I was coming through all of this. That's how I learned. I stick my foot in my mouth. I made a mistake. Somebody corrected me. I avoided that the next time. We all got to be open to allowing one another to make those kinds of mistakes, to grow together. And that, that is, that's a key part of the, 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 the move. Absolutely. And correction is love at the end of the day. If I love you, I correct you. So if, if, if you know, to all of our non-Black allies, you know, even if you come into a space and 
your, you know, your thinking, your mindset, your words are off. It received the correction in love because we just, the correction is just love at the end of the day. Um, and so as we're, as we're wrapping up, this is a final question for all of you. Um, and someone did offer this resource for anybody um, that is watching um, to check out showingupforracialjustice.org showing up for racialjustice.org for anyone that is saying how do i as a non-black want work within the movement um they they shared their website showing up for racialjustice.org so thank you for that catherine for that resource um so just a final question um uh, for for all the panelists and again thank you for all that you shared all the wisdom um and i do hope that those of you that are watching live um, we'll share this out so that this conversation can go further out. Uh, we know hundreds of you were on the Zoom and then hundreds more watching live on Facebook, uh, but we want to continue these conversations going so we can really see some, some significant changes in our world. Um, but here's the last question for each of you. And Jody, I'll start with you and then we'll, we'll kind of go back. Um, um, we'll go to April and then Blossom. Um, is what, if anything, makes you optimistic about the future? What, if anything, makes you optimistic about the future? Yeah, the persistence of the marches, the, the fact that they're so multicultural, multi-ethnic, and they have been, uh, there's been a stick to itiveness there's been endurance, there's been stamina behind mm -hmm. them, right? And that's what it's gonna take. This is definitely not a sprint, but a marathon. Um, but these folks who've been out here, these young folk, mostly, who've been out here are saying we're tired of just the superficial interventions, the band-aids. We're ready to rattle the foundations of this nation. And that's what it's going to take. We're talking about redistributing wealth and power mm -hmm. in a fundamental way if you really want Black lives to matter in America and they are showing that they have that kind of recognition and are ready to push that kind of agenda. And that is what we need, you know? And so that's what gives me the most hope right now. Wonderful, thank you, Joey, I appreciate you. Blossom, what if anything gives you hope or uh, op optimism about the future? Yeah, honestly, just seeing our black community rise. Mm -hmm. Everybody around the world shouting Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. Everyone coming together to protect Black lives. I know my life as a Black trans woman has changed. Also, and I'm going to focus a little bit more specifically on, again, my trans community, because I don't go anywhere without my community. You know, my community is so powerful and so brave. And, you know, we will get through what we're going to get through. And see, we are one of the most resilient communities. Um, being Black on top of that is just a cherry on the cake. We are definitely a resilient community, even though we are having to fight a little bit harder, especially those that intersect with being black and also being trans. We are having to fight a little bit harder, but the reality of it is, I always believe we were given the toughest journey because we are the most resilient and they can twist us, bend us, but they can never break us. As you can see, we are still standing strong. And the one thing that I would love, and I would actually like to make this a call to action, is for everybody to do better about trans people, period. Do better about trans, gender non-conforming, non-binary people, period. Stop erasing the existence of trans people. You have Marsha P. Johnson, who was a prominent figure in the Stonewall riots. One of the reasons why we're able to have pride. We mm -hmm. will not erase her and Sylvia Rivera and so many activists who have led the way for us to even have opportunity to sit here because somebody made a way for each and every one of us to be able to even sit here to have that conversation and we must not erase them. And so I think that's just kind of like the big hope that I'm having that, you know, as 2020 continues on and we continue to disrupt and we continue to dismantle, let's empower yeah. each other. Wonderful, thank you for that Blossom. April, what if anything makes you optimistic about the future? I'm optimistic because I, I'm seeing just with this panel, there is so much heterogeneity within our black community as a biracial woman. You know, you know, I can say that, you know, my experience is not the same as the next black 
woman or the next biracial woman. And I think we're starting to appreciate that in our society by all of these multicultural groups coming together to support. Mm -hmm. I really hope, and, and I think what makes me optimistic is this is the first time that I've seen action, not just lip service, even among systems that have been historically racist. I am starting to see change happen at a level where it's not just, oh yeah, we support diversity and inclusion efforts, but we really don't do anything about it. We expect the, we expect the minorities to do something about that. I'm seeing that change, which is really nice. Beautiful, thank you. And I think for me, what gives me, op what, what I'm optimistic about um, being out with um, the students from LAUSD and, and to Jody's point, um, students getting up early in the morning to be downtown um, and really standing up and their energy and their fervor. And it lets me know that the movement's in good hands. Um, those of us that are a little older, I, I don't, you know, we may not have a whole lot of time left to protest in the <laughs> March, but to see so many young people really engage um, and, and, and not just black kids, white kids, Latino kids, just the full spectrum of youth and young adults um, with so much energy and so much determination. So I do believe the movement um, is in good hands for the future. Um, and so thank you, April uh, Timms, again, um, social neuroscience, leads the social neuroscience and health psychology, I'm gonna get that one day, uh, <laughs> health psychology lab at USC, Dornside College, Letters, Arts and Sciences. Uh, Jody R. Moore, who is USC Gouge Roy P. Crocker, professor of law and an expert on racial justice, and to Blossom Brown, um, who leads the L Los Angeles LGBT Center and the board of the Black LGBTQ Activists for Change. Thank you to each and every one of you for just sharing your time uh, this afternoon. Uh, based upon some of the comments that have come through the Q&A, people have really been enlightened. And, and here's what I wanna just offer to everyone that's watching and those that will watch the replay of this is allow the knowledge and the information that you received today to now move you to the next level, which is accountability and action. Um, be a part of whatever, plug into whatever part of the movement you can plug into. Every email counts, every phone call counts. Um, every time you show up at a board meeting or a city council meeting, all of it counts. Um, if you can protest, go out and protest. All of it counts, all of it matters. Um, and we cannot, I know we didn't get a chance to talk about it today, but we cannot forget Breonna Taylor and all the number of cases where justice has not been uh, the, the, the resolve. And at the end of the day, there must be justice first before we can actually expect and, and, and live in you know, total peace. There must be justice. So let's continue the fight for, for, for those cases. Um, and thank you to each and every one of you. I'm Reverend Najuma Smith-Pollard, Program Manager at the Cecil Murray Center for Community Engagement, which is part of the Center for uh, Religion and Civic Culture at USC. Have a wonderful day, and thank you all for joining us today. Blessings. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, April. Thank you, Blossom. Thank you, Jody. Appreciate you so very much for today. Thank you, Jim. And thank you for all the team in the background. <laughs>